Well, we can all agree that life is made up of the sum of the choices that we make. And some of those choices aren't as easy as others. And we look at life as sometimes the struggle is real. For example, the alarm clock went off this morning and choices had to be made and that struggle was real. And I wanna commend you for making the right choice uh, to come to church today. I manage a fancy football team and those choices have real consequences. And even though I send them gift baskets and words of affirmation each week, they still underperform and make me go to the waiver wire. Let me tell you, that struggle is real. This past Thursday, there was a war in your minds and a decision and choice was made. Do I have four pieces of pie or five? Do I make two trips back? Do I have three helpings? And I won't ask which side won, but we know this, that the struggle is real. We have choices that we make. And the Apostle Paul talks about those choices that are made for when the real struggles come and when the struggle is real. What decision will we make? And we will see that in Romans 12, one through three. And I'll read those verses for you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And the verse we're going to focus on today, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we're going to look at these different parts and realize right off the bat in verse 2 that choices are made based on how you think. In today's world, there is a battle for your mind. It is an ongoing battle. It is a constant battle. It is a battle that constantly invades your favorite TV show. It's called commercials. And in 2022 in the United States alone, companies spent on their marketing, on their marketing dollars increased by 9% to $481 billion. They made that investment in 30 second snippets. They plastered billboards everywhere. You watch a sports game, you see their logo because if you like that, then you'll like this. And you'll be up at night and they even created a TV station, QVC, that will show you why you need this item and why you need 10 of them and why you need them right now. There is a battle for your mind on what you will choose. It is a constant battle. It is, a, it is one that is just never ending. It's just relentless. They want you to think a certain way and they want you to think their way. But the problem is they want you to think their way for their gain and not your gain. And so we see here that the apostle Paul starts talking about how important the mind is because he realizes this, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So what your mind is set on is how you will view your life and that will determine what choice you will make. See, I've worked with teenagers and, I, and this is where you see just this crazy change in thinking. So I, I, I coached them on teams. I, I taught them in PE. I had to take them to camp and you start realizing something. The guys just don't like to shower. They don't like this deodorant thing. They just don't care. And after a while, you just have to tell them, like for the love of everybody else on this planet, you are going to need to take a shower. We have this new technology. It's called deodorant. We need you to apply it. It's a difficult thing. You lift, you swipe, lower. And we have these teaching sessions. And then it's like, hey, do you want to help? Do you want to work? Do you want to get a job? Nope. No. No. And no. But all of a sudden, you start seeing a transformation happen in this young man's life. 
It's called the girl. And a girl comes along and all of a sudden he's in love and all of a sudden showers happen. Clothes are groomed. We care how we look. You can smell them coming a mile away because a gallon of Axe spray has been on them and you don't want to strike a match or they might explode. <laughs> they pick up a job because they want to buy a car because they don't want to pick up the love of their life with their mom in the front seat driving that car. So the motivation has changed. And what we see is that a teenager in love becomes driven. And when you have a new love, that equals new behaviors. And what we find out is that when we love Jesus deeply in our life, and we care about Jesus being in the proper place in our life, all of a sudden we will develop new behaviors. Our mindset will change. And when we love him, all of the patterns in our life will change. It will determine where we spend our money, our talents, and our time. See, because we all know when life gets real and we get into it, we look at that person who shows up. And you have a choice to make on how you react to that person and the struggle becomes real. Do I show them the contempt that's inside or do I show them the compassion that God wants me to show them? You know, that person that shows up at work, the struggle is real. How do I react to them? Do I feel like I need to give them what they deserve? Or do I feel like I need to give them what God thinks they deserve? When it comes to scheduling, and you're doing your calendars, you're doing your time, it's filling up. The struggle becomes real. I got to go here. I got to go there. I got this. We got this on Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. What day is it? And you look at it. What gets carved out first? You're going to make a choice. But let me tell you this. What's going to stay in there is what you love. And if God's calling you to do something, you're like, I don't got the time nor the energy to do that. Guess what? When you love him, that's going to be placed in first. Everything else will go around it. When you're doing your budgets that are getting tighter and tighter because the money just isn't going as far as it used to. And you're balancing your own books and you're balancing your home checkbook and your accounts and all those things. And you realize, hey, this struggle is real. And you start thinking, do I write that tithe check? Nope. Do I write that tithe check? And you're like, I knew it. I knew the pre, he always coming around. All they want is my money. Now, I'll tell you this. When I first started in my Christian teaching job, and I got my check every two weeks, and it was $438. An amazing check. I know. I know you're odd. But I'm telling you, when I sat down and you look, do I write the $43.80 check? Because that could go a long way. Knowing that when I write that check, there's going to be about $50 left to make it to the next one. Man, that struggle is real. But I write the check. Why? Because my love for Jesus and my love for God and my mindset is more important than my personal comfort. That struggle gets real. And as you can see, some weeks I would go in and in my mailbox when I was teaching, someone would put, I don't know who, a Fry's gift card, a grocery card, a gas card. And he would take care of me. He said, oh, you gave because you're going to get. No, because some weeks, guess what? There was no gift card. There was no gift card. And it was $50 to the next paycheck. But as you can tell, I didn't die. I made it. I'm still here today. I'm prospering a little more than I should be these days. But I'm telling you, there's a decision to make and what you love and where your mindset is that when the struggle gets real in your life, that is what will determine what decision you make, what choice you are willing to make. So how does this process begin? He says there's a battle for the mind. So what does your mind need to be? It needs to be transformed. It needs to be renewed. Well, how does that happen? We understand that when he writes this, this right here is an action. Being transformed is an action. It's not describing what should happen. It's describing what you should do. 
It is something that is ongoing. It's not like, oh, I happened once, I'm done. It's a daily decision, it's daily transformation, it's daily how God works in your life. It's taking you from struggle to struggle to process to process, event to event, and he's making you stronger each time. But I wanna tell you what the worst thing that's happened in the American church, not this church, this church doesn't have that problem. Everybody else does, all right? Just so you know, see that, I'm gonna show you. Guess my job here is done. Check. The worst thing that happened is we quit making it action and we got comfortable and we sat down and said, God's done the work. I don't got to do anything. It's all done. My part's here. Check. Struggle is real. And in order to be transformed, you have to be willing to be transformed because there's two parts in this that we have to understand. The first one is this. There is a God and you are not him. I have to look in the mirror and say, Aaron, there is a God and you're not him. You have to look and say, there is a God and you are not him. His ways are not our ways. And what we struggle with and what the struggle is real is that we have to give full control of our lives over to him. And boy, that's hard to lose control, is it? That's hard. That's tough. I don't want to like, God's going to make me do something I don't want to do. It's going to make me uncomfortable. I like comfort. I like the movie seats that go back and recline. I don't want to sit in regular ones ever again. God's going to make me uncomfortable. He's going to make me go do something. And in this transformation, we have to understand, he is making you do something for your own good. He is transforming your life for your own good. And see, we do this in our natural lives. We don't even realize it. We give control over to people all the time. You go and you fly on a plane and you have to realize a simple fact. There is a pilot and I'm not him. I don't want the person next to me who's YouTube certified to go up there and say, hey, I saw this watch. What's this switch do? What's this control do? Oh, I saw if you hit this watch, you could do it. I just watched Top Gun Maverick and if I pull on the brakes, they'll fly right by. I don't want that person up there. I want the pilot who knows everything because he's trained. He has the wisdom. He knows the direction. He understands where I should go. I want him flying the plane. And we have a creator and a God who knows what he wants to do with your life because he loves you and he wants to promise for good and develop you and strengthen you and he wants control of it and we're like, no. And God says, fine, I need to take you through this transformation process so that you can see that I am God and you are not. When I drop off my car to get fixed, there's a sign that's there that my mechanic has. And it says $50 an hour to fix the car. $75 an hour if you watch. $100 an hour if you help. And sometimes God wants us to do something and we want to get in there and tinker with his plan in his direction. No, that's not good. This is what's good. This is what's here. And we need to put our hands off and say, God, you direct my life. You transform my life. You direct where I should go. You are in control. In Romans 9, 20, and 21, he gives this example of the potter and the clay. But who are you, old man, to answer back to God? What is, will the clay, what is molded, say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? And as a church, we have this. God, you don't know what's best. We do. And God's saying, this is what's best for you. And we just need to be willing to do what he asks us to do. The second thing in order to be transformed that we need to realize is that we need to understand the changing power of the gospel. See, if there's this battle for the mind all the time, and there's all these influences coming in, there's commercials, we want you to think this way or that way. There's nothing in the middle. You ever notice that we got, there's nothing in the middle. You're all for me or you're against me. I mean, it's one or the other. You got to choose the camp. And there's all these things going on there. We have to understand the power of the gospel because you're like, how do I transform my life? You have it right here. It's called the living, breathing word of God. 
And if we can invest all our time on TV and watching this stuff, we can invest our time into reading the love letter that God has sent us because he loves us so much, he wants to transform our life into something valuable, we should take the time and get in his word and see the ever powerful changing God and what he can do in our life. The struggle is real while we make the time to read his word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and the discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's a powerful verse. What does that mean? I'm going to be transparent for, with you. This is what it means. There are sometimes I don't want to read the Bible. Let me finish. I don't want to read the Bible because I know what it's going to tell me to do and convict me of that I need to change, and I don't want it. I know it's going to make me go forgive somebody I don't want to forgive. Struggle is real. I know it's going to point out something powerful. Why? Because this is living and breathing, and God speaks to us. And he does that as we're in this word. You say, how do you know it's, it, when it's in this word and how do you know that part? Because I can read a passage 10 times, but for some reason when I read it the 11th time, all of a sudden my eyes are wide open like I never saw that before. I mean, I can't be the only one that's like, wow, this verse fits my situation. Where's it been? Right here all along. But God opens his eyes and says, now this is the verse you need at this time when you're going through your struggle so that you can see I am real. We need to invest time in the changing power of the gospel. The Bible reveals what needs to be changed. See, Daniel understood this. Because when you're changed and transformed, it makes the choices a little easier. See, Daniel was already in the word serving God and he understand that even through prayer to a fault of peril. Which means when they said you can't serve anyone but the king and you can't worship your God anymore, he didn't make out a pros and cons list. It was like, hmm, I don't know. Should I do this over here? Should I not pray? I mean, I'm kind of high in the king's court. I don't know. The con is if I do, I'm gonna be a snack for Leo the lion. I'm going to the lion's den. What I love about it is as soon as the decree was done, as soon as the struggle got real of life and death, what did Daniel do? It says he immediately left and went to his room, opened the shutters, and started praying to his God. The choice was not a struggle. It was, I don't love this world, I love God more. So you can do what you want, I'm going over here. I choose this side. And it was immediate. So it gives this last phrase, this God uses and transforms and renews our mind so that when the struggles really come, we can make the easy choice. It makes it a little easier because he develops this relationship with us. And he starts to add value. When you hone into something and a project and you get to know it, as you hone a new skill, you start to love it more. It has a little more meaning in its life. I mean, I, I watch people that pick up hobbies. You know, all of a sudden, like, they're all in. You know, they, they do a little woodworking, and next thing you know, they're building a dish on their house for a wood shop. You know, they got, like, every tool under the sun. They, they pick up golf, and they're buying $500 clubs, and I'm like, you don't even know what to do with that thing. Like, they can't handle it, but they're just, like, all in on it. And they're out there, like, beating it into submission. I feel bad for the club. But you get these new hobbies and people are all in and all of a sudden it adds values. You get excited about it. You start looking. And this is what, what God does in our lives as he transforms us. We start getting excited. We look and our natural bend in perspective is towards him. And we look at the last part when he says that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is a reflection of his handiwork. So as you become something good, you start becoming proud of it. So for example, if you're a chef and you're out there and you've taken the years and you've honed the skills and you know how to put things together and the, it's not just eating, you know, that's for grunts. You just throw food in your mouth. No, it's an experience. I mean, the food's an experience and it tells a story. And you no longer serve PBJs. No, instead you serve a parade nut spread with a grape relish reduction 
and you paired it with a brioche bun. See, you start seeing things a little more intricate. It's a little more relational. It's a little more value. You care a little bit more about it. And when we develop our relationship with God, in this phrase, it's not we do works to please him. This last phrase, if I can sum it down in the small time we have, it's a reflection of him. These good works are a mirror of what Jesus has done in our lives. It's how the world sees Jesus. When they look at us, it's a world how they, the world sees Jesus through us. And we want to reflect him. We don't want to show them ourselves. And that's what this part is, that they may discern what the will of God is, what's good and acceptable and perfect. We know we can't be perfect, but there is one who is. I'm going to see if I can try it and sum this, this viewpoint up. My first car that I drove it was a sweet 1985 Mercury Marquis station wagon. And when I got it, we called it the silver bullet. And the names changed as I drove that car because someone backed into the passenger door. We didn't have the money to replace it with a silver door. No, the junkyard had a nice UPS brown door to put on it. So all silver with a brown door. And then a tree fell on the hood of the silver bullet, and same thing. No, we couldn't even match the brown door. No, we found at the junkyard a white station wagon hood and replaced that on there. I mean, that was the invention of the hoopty car. I mean, it was, it was horrible. But I had a limited edition one. My limited edition was custom made. Inside had the swag material. Nice navy blue because it would no longer stick to the ceiling. And it was the adventure car because it had this great habit that when you pulled up to a stoplight and you went to, it turned green, you went to go, it had this great feature. It was an engine kill feature. And it would stop. And you would gun it just enough to roll into the middle of the intersection. And it would stop. And then the real adventure started because you had to rip that thing into neutral. Yeah, you saw me up here. We're not down here. Knobs, buttons, all said. We're up here. In the tree, we dropped that into neutral. And you realize the struggle is real. And you're begging, is there a God? Start this car. And you're just cranking out that, cranking out that thing. And my brother's in the seat like, get this started. And we're on the countdown because the light's about to turn green for oncoming traffic to end my life. And all of a sudden it starts up, you gun it, and you drop that thing into drive. And, <laughs> and you celebrate all the way. We got it, man. We made it. <laughs> and there's someone in this room who's had the privilege of being able to ride in that sweet 1985 Mercury, Mercury Marquee station wagon. But I want to tell you, you want to guess where that sweet Mercury Marquis station wagon is today? Yeah, that thing's at the junkyard. I don't even know if that thing exists. It's probably been recycled four times over, smashed into a little tin can. It no longer exists. It served the need and it gone. That was it. It ran till it couldn't run no more. I honestly could not tell you what has happened to that car. It is gone. Gone, gone. But I want to tell you something else that happened in 1985. Not only was a Mercury Marquis station wagon created, but that same very year in 1985, there was another car that was made. A cherry red Ferrari 288 GTO Coupe. It has a five-speed manual transmission. It delivered 400 horsepower with a top speed of 189 miles an hour. My station wagon shook at nine miles an hour. <laughs> As of the year 2023, in the early parts of it, it had only been driven 4,965 miles. This past year, early in the year, it went to auction. And it sold for $3,965,000. Now, I want to tell you, what is the difference between the Mercury Marquis station wagon and that sweet cherry red Ferrari? The value placed on that car. The value placed on that car. 
See, when you go to those car shows and you walk in there to those car shows, what do you see? You see all different makes and models. You see all different colors. You see all different types. You see the owners that are standing next to it. They got the hood up. They're describing every part of that engine. They're telling you how long they had to wait for that part to come in. The, they know the long hours that were taken in the garage, grinding things down, getting it just right. They know how many layers of wax that are on there, 150 so it glosses and shines over. They are proud of that thing and they are ready to show it off to you. And this is what I picture in the Christian life. The value in which the world needs to see is the value Jesus has placed on our life. Because I see God going through this car show in the church where there's all different makes and models. There's all different forms and types. And he's standing by and saying, oh man, look at that car over there. That was Saul. We dug him out of the back barn somewhere. He was all rusted up. But all of a sudden he came to know Jesus. And now when Jesus took over and transformed that car, let me show you what Jesus, my son, did for now Paul. See, it's something to show off. Because when he looks at me, he doesn't see a broken down 1985 Mercury Marquis station wagon that belongs in the junkyard. He sees a sweet red Ferrari 288 GTO coup that was redeemed and transformed by his son. And he says, look world, this is the difference. May we reflect the goodness of God. This is the transforming work that I do. And when I look at it, it's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that I could do, it's not my work. And I know this because Jesus took my place. Because when God looks at me, it's not any works I do, it's in and through me. But he looks at me in a different way and places value on me. Why? Because I now have his son who took my place and he sees his son. See, Jesus came to the earth and guess what? His struggle was real. His struggle was in the garden and he went through and he was on the rock laying on it and the city's just up behind him on the hill where he looks where he's about to be crucified and his struggle is, God, take this cup from me. But guess what? In the middle of that struggle, his choice was already made and it was easy for him. The choice was, you know what? The struggle was real and the sacrifice will be real. But I love them so much, it's worth it. I want to redeem my people. God has sent me. I am the gift to the world to show them how much they are loved. I am their salvation, their hope. And he says, the choice is easy. And he went on the cross and he took my place and he took your place on the cross. But he didn't stay there. He may have struggled on the cross, but he went to the grave and he struggled with death. But guess what? He won. Yes. And what was real is that he walked out of the grave after three days. He rose again and he went up to heaven where he's standing at the throne of God on the right side standing. And guess what he's doing? He is on behalf of me. Action. He is doing the best for me on my behalf. What does that show me? God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's there. He cares. And what the world needs to see, they need to see that God. They need to see what Jesus has done. And when he does things on our behalf, we see that the struggle is real. But I can have the confidence that he is taking care of it. Why? Because I have a confirmed ticket. I've accepted Jesus as my savior. I got a confirmed ticket. See, when you go to fly, there's two types of tickets you can buy. You can buy a confirmed ticket or you can buy a standby ticket. A choice is going to be made. You know the standby people when they come in and they're in the airport terminal. You see them. They're nervous. They're looking at the screen. Am I going to get it? They're going to go up to the agent. The spot open? Is everyone there? Can I get on this plane? Can you just put me in the luggage up top? That's fine. I can ride there. I can make it. Just get me on this plane. They're nervous as all get out. They hope they've done enough good deeds. They hope they're going to make it to heaven. But guess what? Through Jesus' son, I got a confirmed ticket. I got a seat number. I'm getting out of the plane. And when I get there, I'm going to heaven. And I know it's there. And you say, well, how can you make it through the struggles of life? They're so hard. And, and, and what do I do with it? How do I do it all? And I say, guess what? If God was so good to take care of the biggest struggle in our life and the biggest thing by sending his son, taking our place so that I can have a confirmed place in heaven to be with him, guess what? He's going to take care of all the small stuff, no problem. 
So I realized this, in conclusion, the struggle may be real and it may be difficult, but when I serve a God like that, and I've been bought with such a precious price, that when he looks at me, he sees a red Ferrari 288 GTO, the struggles may be real and difficult, but guess what? The choice of which side I'm going to choose is not. It's not. Think about it. I want to choose the side where the world just wants to use me for whatever it can get. Get whatever it can squeeze out of me and leave me high and dry in the junkyard. Or I choose the God who loves me so much he sends his only son, takes my place. He's on the right hand of the Father on my behalf, working in my life, transforming my life, cares about me, gives me the value of being redeemed by his son. Mm, I don't know, what choice should I make? I'm thinking, what an awesome thing we have that we make that choice, but guess what? The choice is a whole lot easier because when I see what God has done for my life, when the struggle gets real of what should I do one way or the other, I say, it may hurt, it may be difficult, but I'm choosing God every time. I'm choosing God every time. But it'll cost you, I'm choosing God every time. And that is our challenge. May we develop that mindset. That no matter what the struggle may be, when God lays something on our heart, we're not like, mm, I kind of want this comfort over here. None of that matters. May we always and consistently choose God. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for what you have done in and through your son. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you care about us enough to send your son. But we also realize the fact that it is only because of your son that we have value. We are nothing in and of ourselves. But it is you, God, who has made us and transformed us in new creation. We know there's a battle for our mind. And God wants us to choose in the commandments. Put no other God before me. We know you are a jealous God. Why are you a jealous God? Because you sent your son to die in our place. And God, out of that gratitude, when the different struggles come and the different transformation processes happen, may we just take our hands off and say, God, you are the creator. You know what's best for us. God, I choose to serve you. May that be our prayer each and every day. God, I choose to serve you. Lord, I pray if there are some in his room that are looking like, I've never met this Jesus. I've never been transformed. But I want to have some value. I want to know what it's like to have the free gift of God. May you lay on their hearts today that they may know you and choose you today. In Jesus' name, amen.